All right, dear, dear friends, welcome back to another very special episode of Dr. J Radio Live. Today, it's not going to be a guest. I am continuing with the promises I made of airing these three documentaries. A couple weeks ago, or actually longer now, you all got a chance to see Alien Human Project Part 1. Now, this is Alien Human Project Part 2, and let me tell you a little tiny backstory about this. Ironically, what you're going to see in this one is my very, very, very first interview ever. Uh, long before I got into radio, uh, it's a long story. The point is, is now you all have a chance to both see this video, this movie that was made with the third phase of moon, Blake and Brett Cousins in Hawaii, along with myself, just the three of us, and of course, Dr. Roger Lear. And uh, again, like I said, uh, my questions to him were all off the cuff, and I hope you all enjoy it. And I will be in chat, so if anybody else wants to ask me questions, by all means. If at the end of this people want to have you know, questions to me, of course, I will stick around as long as people are interested. Now, as I hit this to start, let me also please advise you folks that, hey, all support is always appreciated. Whatever you could do, if you could skip Starbucks for a day and throw it into Super Chat, then you guys are helping a good cause so we can continue to bring these films to you. Now, I am in the movie. You don't see me full size because, you know, I'm filming Dr. Roger Lear, but you could tell it's my voice and I'm the one wearing a suit. And you'll see in the opening, Blake and Brent Cousins in there uh, introducing the film because it was a collaboration. So... Without further ado, here it goes. third phase of moon my name is Blake Cousins and in this episode we're gonna go over by popular demand the alien human project part 2 dr. Roger Lear and his claims of removing alien implants is in a doubt it is scientific fact now for this exclusive part 2 the alien human project let's get to it world-renowned Dr. Lear, when we made Alien Human Project Part 1, it had a global impact. We've had people that came out that never wanted to talk about their experiences, and now because of the courage that you've put yourself out to get those implants, they now have come forward. What inspired you to, to continue to do this in the face of all these ridicule? Well, you mean, of course, the fine line that I walk. Yes. <laughs> the line of uh, academia, medicine, and research into uh, a tremendously unknown subject. And I say unknown subject, although it's been in existence for thousands of years, because there really isn't that much physical evidence of, you know, things that happen uh, within the field of ufology. Uh, you know, we've seen things flying in their skies. We've we've looked at uh, at uh, drawings and cave paintings and wood carvings that have been in existence for thousands of years. But you know, people have been looking for the so-called smoking gun, uh, and that's what we seem to have found. Maybe on purpose and maybe by accident. I'm not convinced to this day. Why is it that I'm the only one? it seems to be on this entire planet that seems to be removing objects from individuals and then subject them to severe academic analysis and come up with things that are not from this world. You just got to my next point exactly. When you look at a photograph now, 50 years ago a photograph would have been proof, but now with Photoshop it could be doctored. What you've been removing is the smoking gun and a lot of critics especially the skeptics always have an explanation for it let's go deeper into 
why we can prove this is the smoking gun and how you would want to invite the academics to look at the lab reports that you've gotten. Well, as to whether uh, I consider myself uh, an academic science, I don't. I'm more like the, uh, the plumber or the purveyor of the merchandise. I get it out of the human body, the individual that has it, and then I present it to science you know, as an ordinary individual. I'm sure they have some respect because of my medical background, but it's the word that comes from them after analysis that they are telling me that these objects contain things like non-terrestrial isotopic ratios, that they contain carbon nanotube structures, which are very complex. And uh, we're looking at a technology which eight, maybe nine years ago, uh, there were scientists, noted academic scientists that said they couldn't exist. And now there are companies who are actually using them, making them. Japan is trying to make them into a cloth so that they make clothing out of them. They're talking about a space tower because they are the strongest substance known to man. And if you build a space tower that goes up a mile or two above the earth and then launch a vehicle from there, you've saved a tremendous amount of money in fuel because you don't have to defeat the amount of gravity that you do from an earth launch. So we, look, we find carbon nanotechnology and we find things that we don't understand. We find uh, gold spheres for example, that uh, we don't understand what they do. We find apertures in the metal which are only as wide as one atom. Now that's pretty small. And we haven't been able to yet look down into that aperture and see what's down in there. But uh, one day we will do that. We know that they, they emit radio waves. We know that they have electromagnetic fields and an electromagnetic residue, which lasts for about uh, 30 to 60 days following the removal. So these are all scientific facts. These are facts that in written reports I get from academia, and I mean top academia because we have, you know, three of the world's finest nuclear physicists uh, on our science board for ANS research. And that's not including the myriad of other well-respected laboratories like Los Alamos National Labs, Southwest Labs, uh, and I could go on and on and on with a list of laboratories. You know, one thing I love is what separates you from all the other researchers is you are a doctor and a scientist that works with data. Like you said, you don't, you're just a plumber. You pull these out and it's the lab reports that are telling you what this is. So everybody out there who's listening and watching this documentary, request the lab reports. They are available to be read. As a matter of fact, aren't they on your website? Yes, there's a number of different laboratories. Uh, the reports are listed on the website. And uh, we also have taken consideration that the initial uh, scientific results came from the National Institute for Discovery Science, which was Bob Bigelow. And he is the one that paid for and got the reports and material from, uh, from Los Alamos National Labs and New Mexico Tech. So I had nothing to do with it at all just presenting him with the specimens and having him send them to the laboratory. And when they came back originally, there was a, a giant a booklet of data. However, there was no report. And that irritated Mr. Bigelow to the point where he called the lab up and he said, look, I'm paying for this. I want a report. And that's when the first report came in and the scientists that looked at it said these were closest to meteorite samples. Now that was a shock. You, you just mentioned Arthur or Bob Bigelow, who was well known for the Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, his name has been thrown around ufology for the last couple of years. He's somewhat, somewhat been in the limelight. Do you think with his Skinwalker Ranch, the laboratory results that he got from funding your research, was, did he possibly make anything from uh, what he learned? 
And, and monetary gain, absolutely no. He put out all of his money, never asked me for to spend uh, a penny. And now he, of course, has a company called Bigelow Aerospace. And with uh, the consent of the government, he's in a position where he can actually regulate some things because of the nature of the space business. When Doc or Mr. Bigelow became involved, do you? He's linked with SpaceX, which is making enormous leaps. They just tested a new rocket, which is called the Grasshopper, a reusable rocket that's not going to re burn or burn up in the atmosphere. Do you think? With the lab reports that I was saying, uh, do you think he used any of the findings to apply them to his technologies in SpaceX or any anything else that he's doing? That I can't answer. I, I don't know because I'm I'm not uh, knowledgeable of what it takes to put a vehicle into space. Now the next thing is that I know that he took designs <laughs> that he purchased from NASA. Uh, for example, the expandable module that didn't have uh, you know anything to do with what uh, the findings that I was uh, finding with the implant subject, but yet it took a technology that he developed and he put up you know uh, the Genesis space module Genesis one and Genesis two, and uh, then looked at all the data coming in and they are much much safer space vehicles than the International Space Station. You, let's go back and talk about the, tech, the actual technology. One thing I love is it has we, our technology as a human race grows, we're able to dive in these things deeper. One thing you mentioned was single sized atom particles. What on earth can be made that, into a size of one atom? Virtually nothing that a human being can do, right? Well, now, we can use single size atom in what we call nanotechnology. That is nanotechnology. If you take a single carbon atom and you string two of them together, and then three and then four and put them in a circle, then you have a, a circle of uh, uh, carbon nano atoms. And if you extend this into a tube, you have a CNT or carbon nanotube. Now, if you extend that out, then you have something that's similar to wiring without insulation. So let's say you take uh, one of these carbon nano strands and you wrap two of them together, and then you can actually make a cable and you get a carbon nano bundle. But this is uh, sub microscopic. You have to look at this on the level of an electron microscope. So we, we have it, we are using it. And this is the, from what I understand from reliable sources, is the basis for communication in the future. Uh, just as uh, Star Trek uh, talked about, you know, going to subspace frequency. Well, how do you communicate if you're in deep space? Are you going to wait the length of time that it takes us to get a signal from Mars back to Earth? No. So you go into another technology, which is scalar wave technology, faster than the speed of light. And uh, some laboratories, very few, I won't mention who they are, but they are uh, conducting experiments with scalar waves. And they told me that this is the communication of the future, both in, in television and, and radio uh, communication. Carbon nanotubes, or the nanotechnology that we humans are using now was not available when you first removed the first implant, correct? That is absolutely correct. Carbon nanotubes were an argument. It was only existent in the minds of certain scientists that said, perhaps carbon nanotubes exist, exist in nature, but we can't find them. Perhaps they could exist if you could make them. But then the other half said, no, it's impossible. You can't make them. And now to see what you know that technology was then and what the technology is today, because a carbon, a carbon nanotube today can be single walled, double walled, triple walled, and you still have that, that aperture in the center, like the center of a hose. And you can put other material in that center. 
and that's called a doped carbon nanotube. So let's say you make a very small one, very small doped carbon nanotube. Let's say that the, the substance in the middle of it is a very potent antibiotic. You can give that person an injection of that antibiotic in this carbon nanotube and have the carbon nanotube go directly to the area of the infection, a tumor or, or something else, or a drug to, create, uh, to, uh, to treat cancer, for example. So the, the implications of carbon nanotube technology alone are, uh, pardon the pun, out of this world. You mentioned that there were scientists debating on both sides, yet you had something in your possession that was artificially made that contained those. Now, do you think, fast forward to when humans started using things on the nanotechnology level, do you think that it's possible the government may have seen your, uh, your lab reports and may have used certain labs, you've used that to actually get to us humans using this nanotechnology? Well, the possibility of uh, government uh, looking at my work and uh, copying it, so to speak, or using the things that uh, our scientists have uh, uh, illuminated, uh, I doubt whether that's true because uh, a lot of this may have gone back to Roswell back engineering. We're talking about almost 60 some odd years. They've had uh, a 60 some odd years, let's say, jump on anything that I ever did. So I'm sure that within the black budget projects, they already know all the stuff that we're learning and trying to present to the public and to, and to industry. Because some say that black budget technology in compared to academic science is 100 years ahead. But again, when we're talking about carbon nanotubes, you also mentioned something about gold sphere. Can you expand on that a little bit? These small gold spheres that we find, uh, but we don't know what they do. Uh, we also find what are called orthorhombic crystals, and these are crystals composed of sodium chloride. Now, sodium chloride is just ordinary table salt, but the crystals of the salt are random. There's no particular shape. These are a particular rectangular shape and in varying sizes. So they're called orthorhombic sodium chloride crystals. Now, if we think back to the early days of radio, and what did we have? We had a crystal set, you know, and a copper wire, and an earphone, and a battery, and we were able to get a miraculous radio station through a crystal. Well, crystallography or crystallography, the study of crystals today, still can't explain what happens uh, with the atomic structure inside a crystal that will allow a frequency to be carried and then received. And yet we've as been far using, as we know, and we've been using that, and we've been using that constantly. Uh, until we went to a different uh, technology, which was the you know, vacuum tube and then transistor technology. But in all the radios, it, all during World War II, all the aircraft radios, when you switched from one station to the other, all uh, a lever was doing was going from one cr uh, crystal to another crystal to another crystal. They were all multiplex crystal sets. Again, more proof that using something without possibly knowing it, and what can that lead to? Now, I want to focus more on why this is the smoking gun, because we know it's the smoking gun, yet those people out there watching this, some of the people who left on the comments, and this first one was released to great fanfare, and there was a lot of people that said for us, and wow, this really is happening, and it's there. But there still is others who are on the fence. Let's dive deeper into proving to them. We got the lab reports. We see the carbon nanotubes, we see the gold spheres. Let's talk about the radio waves and the, the electromagnetism results and what else you can tell everybody. Okay, first of all, there's a certain percentage of these that we've removed, that uh, about 70% that uh, emit a radio wave in the FM band. 
And when we looked at a classified uh, chart of where these frequencies occur, both in the kilohertz and megahertz range, we, we know that they are deep space fixed or mobile deep space frequencies. Now, is it, oh, the question is, are we really detecting deep space frequencies or are we merely detecting a harmonic of some other transmission of another kind of a wave, as that I mentioned before, a scalar wave technology that enters our electromagnetic spectrum and we get what's called a harmonic. And that harmonic in our spectrum are these radio waves that we receive. Now, the other possibility, of course, which in today's world you can't deny, uh, is the possibility that a deal has been made between somebody from out there and somebody from here so that they can gain the same data that somebody from out there is listening to. And I believe this is, this is biological data and it's data having to do with the progression of our DNA. Because if we look at abduction cases all over the world, we see that there's the taking of sperm and ova. That means a genetic experiment is being carried out on human beings on the face of this planet. And if that's true, then maybe they want to find out, just like we do using human logic, how long a bear sleeps or hibernates during the winter, uh, what the metabolism of the body. For example, John Glenn, when he went into space, he complained on national TV of having to swallow implants because it was necessary for mission control to know his body functions. And the only way that they could get it in was to have him swallow them. So he, he did, he, he swallowed them and they got the information. But you know, to, to make a comparison, suppose somebody else wanted to know the information that NASA was getting. They would you know tune in on it and they would be able to get it too because they're not operating in a scalar wave or unknown technology. So those are the two possibilities. One is that they are true radio frequencies that we're getting or that they are harmonic of something like a scalar wave which travels through space faster than the speed of light. Since the last film, Alien Human Project 1, there have been significant changes, such as the citizen hearing. Can you tell everybody in the world who's watching this what changes you've had, including your testimony there, what else you've done, what else your research has unlocked? Well, in case uh, the viewer of this program doesn't know what the citizen's hearing is, it was a hearing that was conducted in Washington, D.C. at the National Press Club, and it was set up to mimic the way a hearing would be conducted in Congress. And we had uh, retired uh, uh, congressional members <laughs> that uh, composed a committee that would conduct a hearing just as if it was in Congress. And we also know now that while the congressional hearing was going on, President Obama was in residence down the street. And we also have information leading to believe that he knew exactly what was going on with the conference that we were having. So uh, since that time, you know, an effort is being made, including me as uh, one of the witnesses that testified uh, to try and get that information because it's a worldwide event. It's not a United States event. It affects the entire planet. And so we want to get this information out to the public. So I'm working with uh, Steve Bassett and the Paradigm Group on several different projects. Each one works in conjunction with the other. The first thing is to get uh, the 35 hours of testimony in a DVD set out to the public, out, out to the public in general. And uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to send each single member of Congress their assistance and the White House staff and the president a full set of copies of this hearing. 
That's number one. Number two is that uh, Senator Mike Gravel and uh, Congresswoman Carolyn Kirkpatrick is working on a situation where there'll be a bill that will go before the United Nations General Assembly and we're trying to get a hearing before the United Nations General Assembly. So these are two, two of the three projects that I'm involved in now. Uh, so it's uh, public education, education of the entire planet that be, we have been and are being visited and interfered with uh, by non-terrestrial beings, whether they be from another dimension or another planet or somewhere else or within the earth or already living here. Entities that are, have been kept in secret from the general public of the planet. We want that knowledge out. So that's one of my primary goals since we did uh, the last alien human contact. That's what the goal of Third Phase of Moon is to get the word out. The mainstream media is not doing their job and that's exactly why we're interviewing here you again because you have, like we said, the smoking gun. We really hope people pay attention to it. Now, one of the Roper polls said one in 40 people have been abducted, which is a staggering, staggering number. The people that have had them removed, have any of them had a, a repeat abduction where another insertion was made? Uh, in short, has anyone had uh, any uh, new installations of uh, implants? And as far as I know, no. Now you gotta remember that it's not every single abductee that gets implanted. Uh, we figure you know, that there's something close to human logic that they may be using. So well, what we do is about 15% of the species we were, that we are studying will get implanted so we can remotely get the information we need. Not to say that myself or anyone else should have the ego to try and look at the logic of a civilization which may be 80 to 100 million years older than we are. How could we possibly conceive their thought processes or compare their thought process to us? But if we base this only on human logic, you don't have to implant every single abductee subject. And since they're working with humans, you know, again, maybe they have to lower themselves to human uh, resources and human technology uh, in order to get the information that they need. So that's possible too. It may be just as hard for an 80 million or a year old civilization to communicate with us thought-wise than it is for us to conceive of them being able to do what they do. Do you think by you removing those 17 implants may have possibly disrupted them to want to put them in more secretive areas? Uh, the answer to that is no, because um, it seems to me that if they wouldn't uh, allow me to take these out, uh, in a literature search I did before I ever started doing this, uh, nobody was ever successful in removing a suspected alien implant they would turn to powder or disappear or whatever. So uh, maybe there is a group that says, yes, you go ahead, take them out because in certain individuals, we don't need them anymore and go ahead, analyze them, you know, and then reach out, you know, to the public and give this to the public as public knowledge because one of these days, there's going to be openness between us and the human race on planet Earth. So, but, you know, not to say that there is another group that might be involved that said, oh, we're gonna make sure that they can't take this out. But interesting, there has been uh, evidence that people have had implants come out of an eye. Uh, also, one of the most famous implants of all has been implants that have been in the nose associated with nosebleeds and, and the whole uh, gamut of things that go along with it. I don't have one of those. I've never seen one, but I've heard story after story after story. 
And I guess if I keep doing this, maybe someone will come along and sneeze, and they'll actually sneeze into a cloth or Kleenex or whatever, and there one will be, and we can look at it. Now that we're talking about uh, medical procedures in essence, I wanted to touch on something you mentioned in the last film, that there's no inflammatory response upon removal or insertion of these objects. What can you reiterate to the world how important this is to the medical community if they would just take a look at your research? Well, if we could get uh, academic research medicine to look at the materials, it is very possible that we could duplicate what is the cause of this non-rejection, non-inflammatory reaction. And, and duplicate it and then use it in, for example, uh, wrapping a pin, a screw, a liver, a heart, or any transplanted organ into the body. And being that it's your own DNA, you wouldn't reject it. You wouldn't have to be taking uh, anti-rejection medication for the rest of your life. Uh, at a tremendous loss, I'm going to be very honest, it would be a tremendous economic loss to the pharmaceutical industry. To do, do they really want that to happen? I mean, the public certainly would love it to happen. Now, I was just uh, perusing an article on uh, modern uh, 3D printers, and they expect within five years, five short years, that they will able to, well, they will be able to reproduce a cardiac cell and have it duplicate in a 3D printer a human heart with its the same DNA. A person will not be uh, waiting for a donor. They'll just duplicate this in a 3D biological printer and they'll install it into the body. And you won't need any of that medication, that anti-rejection medication. It's ironic you mentioned 3D printing. As a matter of fact, on the news the other night, they showed a demonstration of a 3D printer making a pizza. <laughs> yeah. Now let's get to a final message you have to the world. Anything you want to tell them. Viewers, skeptics, believers alike, everybody. What would you have to say? What I would say would be to repeat <coughs> what uh, Senator Gravel said to us at the closing of the citizens hearing. And that if you really want an impact on the world this for this subject don't leave it up to governments to do it do it yourself each individual it's their responsible Oh, geez, I'm so sorry, folks. We cut out the past the last literally a few seconds, but I will uh, add it on to you. That way you guys can have a chance to finish it. That was a little technical screw-up on my part. And, of course, you can't trust technology these days. Anyhow, I did hope you all had a chance to enjoy what you had a chance to see. Uh, like I said, this is a joint production that I did with Blake and Brent Cousins of Third Phase of Moon and myself. They did a lot of work considering we've done this with two different states. I was just the guy who was asking the questions off the cuff to Dr. Roger Lear, and I had filmed it from a camera. Uh, actually an iPhone, and sent that footage over to Blake and Brent, and also what we had some B-roll from Dr. Roger Lear, and of course he also had a chance to show us the implants, if you remember from part one, when Jack uh, was the one who was interviewing Dr. Roger Lear, and he had a chance to speak to the scientist. So, now that it is over, I let me see if there's any question for you here for for me and also keep in mind what i did say earlier please pay attention to third phase of moon tonight and every single day i i'm fortunate to not only been working with these two brothers for eight years in the last couple of weeks they've been doing very special reports and uh, there's a lot of correspondence uh, multiple people involved and we're all giving our opinion on what is happening and 
again, I'll say this, I've said it in their chat multiple times, I've said it in a couple of videos I've done on their channel, I truly believe we are being invaded. Not being invaded like D-Day where they're going to attack us, I'm talking about things are showing up to watch us more than ever. Very crazy time. Now folks, with that being said, I will go back and try to fix this last literally it was like 30 seconds and I don't know how that screwed up but at least you got all of it and that's what counts to me okay here is a question preferably please write to them in caps uh, Rick Roberts okay Dr. Roger Lear died on a Friday afternoon in March I believe 2014 he had 17 implants uh, the last surgery was seven uh, surgery 17 unfortunately after he died the implants scattered with different people who wanted to get them. I do know one person who I'm not going to say their name who took a lot of them and will never show them or bring them. I did know at the time that Dr. Roger Lear's widow still had possession of one of the implants. Whether she sold it, whether she did something with it, I'm not too sure, but I will call her at some point and see if it's still there because with the technology we have now, we can actually look into these implants and figure out much more than say 10 years ago, eight years ago. And even long before that, when Dr. Roger Lear started first removing these implants, Anything else, folks? I guess we are caught up. Like I said, I check out Third Phase of the Moon tonight and every single night, day and night. And you'll see my little uh, small segment there. And uh, they got some amazing footage. And I'm very excited for you folks to see it. And remember, Third Phase of the Moon is linked to this channel. It's, one, it's the only featured channel, as a matter of fact, that I have linked to my account. And so... Uh, obviously, they're in the chat. Just click on their name. Uh, they're the only. They're the moderators here, and there's a um, a check mark next to them because they are verified. So you can click on that. It'll take you to their channel, or just go into my featured channels, and I, it'll take you straight to them. Because, like I said, they're the only one. Let me see what else here. Is anyone picking up where Roger Lear left off? You know, that's something really, really sad. Uh, in the last two years of Roger's life. We were trying to find somebody who would, you know, take the torch and carry on with, with his work. And he died suddenly from a blood clot. I, it's a, I don't want to go into the details of how it happened on that day, but he left us suddenly and before he can name someone to continue the research. So whoever does pick up on this research is essentially going to have to do it from scratch, meaning they're going to have to find their own implants, their own abductees willing to be operated on. And I don't know how much data is still available from Dr. Roger Lear uh, that maybe can be used by the next surgeon or doctor, because I am very sad that no one has stepped up to the plate. So that's where it stands. And uh, yeah. Again, this is some of the best evidence we can ever find, especially when these implants seem to magnetize things like your bone. They're also consistent with sending a signal to deep space, which somebody out there or something out there is receiving this signal. And they f seem to feed off of us at like we're batteries since we have natural electricity running through our uh, bodies. These implants seem to be alive because of that. Yet when they're removed from people, they essentially stop working. Also, many of them, if not all of them, you cannot even cut with a scalpel. It's, it's amazing uh, how, much, how detailed these things are and how much uh, information is there that when I have skeptics on, uh, you know, Robert Schaefer, um, I've even talked to Michael Scherf Shermer off air. They just blow it all out of the water talking about shrapnel or something else. Well, I got to tell you, the implants that I held in my hand, I saw I was at the laboratory getting the test results. These are very anomalous. Let me say one more thing too, folks, is that after these implants started to be removed, people that were taken started reporting having 
different uh, implants put in different areas. I'm sure most of you recall from if you saw the documentary or not documentary movie communion based on Whitley Strieber when an implant was essentially shoved up his nose with some tool and there was like a cracking noise. That's one area where they've been putting them in. But since Dr. Roger Lear started removing them, get this, they would essentially, your eyeball would come out literally hanging by the ligament and they would place the implants behind your eye. That way there is no way we can get them unless it's from someone who's passed away. And um, of course, other people have also uh, said that they've had x-rays and have found some of these implants underneath their skull, inside their skull, uh, near the brain. So I, th for those people who want them removed, I'm sorry, that's not going to happen. But uh, yeah, and I hope anybody out there who is an abductee and who does think he has an implant, the protocol Dr. Roger Lear asked for, which I did this for him as well, is to ask those people who think they've had an implant to go get x-rays. And if the x-ray shows something anomalous that's not explainable, then they proceed on to the next step. I do know a couple of people I could put you in touch with. Again, they're not the people that are carrying Dr. Roger Lear's work, but at least one of them is still dealing with implants and the other one is the person who uh, introduced me to the laboratory and also keep in mind Dr. Roger Lear was overseeing the surgery there's actually another surgeon who was present for the 17th surgery not in any of what you saw here because surgery 17 was the last one he did. I guess with that being said, folks, I've shown you two of the three documentaries made with me and the cousins of Third Phase of Moon. There is one more, which is Alien Abduction Diaries. Fantastic documentary, and you will actually see me on camera there from eight years ago, so keep that in mind. And I, I really enjoy that film because it, Instead of showing you just implants, you actually get to hear from multiple people about their abduction. So with that being said, friends, I think I've said enough. And I guess at this point, I will figure out what I can do tomorrow if I am not too tied up or working somewhere else. Um, and let's uh, let, and another thing, as I said yesterday, anybody who has any way they can, or any free time to help us. Uh, me and Pam have a tough road uh, getting things done on this. If anyone knows video editing, if people are social media um, experts and are always in there because I don't use social media and I'm kind of happy because my brother who is always on Facebook is so uh, dependent on that. The point is, if there's anything you can contribute to this show, our eyes are always, our ears and eyes and our hearts are always open for you folks. Now, if you do want to contact me after a show is done being live, after it's live, you write a comment, any video, and I will get it. I will respond to you. In the past, I would have said use Twitter and tag me. But now since they banned me on Twitter and I'm a little sad because I lost uh, close to 40,000 uh, followers. So I created a new Twitter, uh, which is Dr. J Radio Live New. I think there's two people following. So unless that grows, uh, I'm going to stick with the fact that people can leave a uh, a comment on the videos after they are done and I will respond. And also you can email Dr. J Radio Live Guests at Gmail. D R J Radio Live Guests. G U E S T S plural at gmail.com. And I believe there's another email we set up a while ago which is Dr. J Radio Live Team at gmail.com. So if you want to send an email, CC it to both of them. I personally don't check my emails as often because they're so full of spam so leaving a comment on a video after it's live then will be the quickest way for me to see it and with that being said folks you have a great night make sure you watch third phase of moon special report tonight and i will catch you on the flip side